My name is Pamela Ellsworth and I'm here today to speak to you on common pediatric problems in neurology, what is normal and when you should worry. We're going to talk first about evaluation of the swollen scrotum. When evaluating a child presenting with a swollen scrotum, you're going to want to perform a history as well as a physical examination. In the history, you'll want to know about the onset of the swelling, the duration of the swelling, whether or not there has been any prior history of scrotal or groin trauma, whether or not the swelling is changing in size over the course of the day, particularly if you notice the swelling to be greater in the end of the day after the child has been upright and less in the morning after sleeping. In addition, a history of prior inguinal or scrotal surgery should be elicited. On physical examination, you want to pay attention to whether or not the swelling is unilateral or bilateral and perform a careful examination of the inguinal and scrotal area, taking into account the degree of swelling, whether or not there's any erythema of the skin, in duration of the skin, whether the testis is present on that side. You can transilluminate the scrotum to determine whether or not a hydrocele is present. And you can evaluate for a blue lesion at the top of the scrotum that would be consistent with the blue dot sign or a torus testicular or epididymal appendage. Pain versus no pain is important. And watch how the child walks into the room and gets on the examining table to also elucidate whether or not there is any discomfort. Similarly, I would ask the child if he is comfortable lying still or whether the pain persists despite movement. On physical examination and testicular torsion and symptoms, typically the physical exam will reveal a higher riding testicle on the affected side. The testicle will often have a transverse lie compared to the normally descended upright testicle. When you tickle the inner thigh to elicit a cremasteric reflex, that is typically absent with a testicular torsion. An examination of the scrotum, the testis and epididymis, typically with a torsion, the testis itself is tender, may also involve the epididymis. In contrast to epididymitis, where the child will often point to the upper part of the scrotum as the area of tenderness. Associated nausea or vomiting is commonly seen with testicular torsion and is far less frequent with epididymitis. The child's gait may be affected both with epididymitis as well as testicular torsion, and they tend to walk with a broad base gait because the pain is worse when something is touching the area. If the child notes pain even when not moving, that should raise the bar for a suspicion of testicular torsion. The differential of a, of a painful swollen scrotum includes epididymitis and orchitis, as well as torsion of the epididymal or testicular appendage, as well as testicular tumors, perhaps a bleed into a tumor, trauma such as a testicular rupture, hydrocele, and then testicular torsion. We're going to move on next to undescended testes or cryptorchidism. A testicle that fails to descend properly into a proper scrotal position is consistent with a undescended testis. A congenital undescended testis is a testis that is not present in the scrotum at birth, whereas an acquired undescended testis is one that has formally descended but has subsequently been noted outside of the scrotum. Ascending testicles are a change in testicle and location that occurs spontaneously after birth, as opposed to an acquired one, which may occur after scrotal surgery or related to a prior retractile testis that has ascended. And trapped undescended testis occurs typically after an inguinal surgery such as a hernia repair. Retractile testis is one that is initially extrascrotal on examination or moves easily out of the scrotum but can be manually replaced into the scrotum, will be in a dependent position, and will re remain in the scrotum without tension, at least initially after the exam. The guidelines from the American Neurological Association on Cryptorchidism came out in 2014, and there are several differences compared to prior guidelines. The guidelines recommend that one palpate the testes for quality and position at each recommended well child visit. 
Infants with a history of an undescended testis who have not had spontaneous descent by six months of age should be referred to a pediatric surgical specialist, i.e. a pediatric urologist or a pediatric surgeon who treats undescended testes. All boys should be referred with a possible new diagnosis of undescended testis after six months of age. And particularly, all phenotypic boys with bilateral, non-palpable, undescended testes should be evaluated for a possible disorder of sexual development. We'll talk next about hydrocele. A communicating hydrocele that accounts for the majority of new hydrocele occurring after birth and before puberty associated with a patent process is vaginalis. They typically present as a painless bulge in the scrotum with possible extension into the groin. Because there is a communication and fluid from the abdominal cavity can move down into the scrotum and back into the abdomen, they may be intermittent in nature and typically can be decompressed with manual compression. Surgical intervention is warranted in the case of a communicating hydrocele due to the potential risk of an associated hernia. A non-communicating hydrocele may be identified postnatally or appear after puberty. These typically resolve in infancy within the first year of life. Non-communicating hydrocele in the pubertal male are unlikely to resolve and surgical intervention is frequently occurred. We talk about phimosis. Phimosis is physiologic in the newborn and one should not forcefully retract the foreskin in an infant with phimosis. Indications for treatment of phimosis include recurrent inflammation or irritation or balanopostitis of the foreskin and glands, ballooning of the foreskin with voiding, pain with erections, and dribbling after voiding. One often asks, when is it typical for the foreskin to retract in a child? And if you look at this diagram, only 4% of foreskins will spontaneously retract at birth, whereas by three years of age, 90% of foreskins will retract. And actually by 17 years of age, 99% of foreskins will spontaneously retract. When faced with a child with a non-retractable foreskin who is symptomatic or older, the recommended treatment is first a trial of a topical steroid cream. There are a number of steroid creams that have been used. I typically use 0.05% topical beta-methasone. Efficacy rates range from 65 to 95%. Typically, one applies the cream to the phimotic ring, the area of contracture that limits retraction, twice a day for four weeks, and then reassess the response. Betamethasol, clobetasol, excuse me, 0.05%, is a less potent topical steroid, and it's also very effective. In terms of evaluating a child for circumcision to determine who should be circumcised and who should not be circumcised, Indications for circumcision include recurrent urinary tract infections, severe balanopostitis, balanitis zerotica obliterans, vesicoureteral reflux as a relative indication, a history of paraphimosis, and a child that requires clean intermittent catheterization. Contraindications to neonatal circumcision or circumcision in general include prematurity, for a neonatal circumcision, a family history of bleeding disorders in an infant that has not been tested, presence of a hypospadias or epispadias, significant penoscrotal webbing, a micropenis, a megalourethra, a child in whom the ambigu there is ambiguous genitalia and one has not indeed confirmed the sex of the child, bilateral large hydrocele's, a buried or concealed penis, and congenital penile lymph edema. Risks of circumcision, more commonly encountered risks of circumcision include a buried penis, meatal stenosis, which occurs related to irritation of the urethral meatus from chemicals in the diaper, and can be prevented by the use of a topical antibiotic to the tip of the penis after circumcision for the first week or so, meatitis, inflammation of the meatus, poor cosmesis, penile skin bridges, which is adherence of the penile shaft skin to the glands that's related to scar formation. This will not resolve spontaneously over time. 
recurrent perpetual adhesions where the glands, the penile skin sticks to the glands, but this is not related to scarring and will spontaneously resolve over time, and the removal of too much or too little penile skin. More serious complications of circumcision include a urethrocutaneous fistula, injury to the glands and frenulum, sepsis, penile necrosis and amputation, risks of anesthesia, and hemorrhage. Thank you for listening.